if you don't have a glass of wine, I encourage you to go get one now. <laughs> Julie's like, I'm already set to go. <laughs> Um, l'chaim, l'chaim, for those of you that do have a glass of wine, please join me in making a bracha. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Borei Peri HaGafen. Amen. If you're drinking something else, whiskey, water, tea, please don't forget to make a shahakal. So welcome to Wine and Wisdom for today, or this week, which is Parshat Vayetze. And this week's lesson is titled Rooting Out Recidivism. The quest to cure the problem and not the symptom. And if I may say so, it's a class that I'm very much looking forward to discussing with you today. We started a conversation on Facebook, which uh, really sparked some interesting, uh, some interesting conversation for those of you that were following. Um, I asked a very simple question, which is what are, you, what are, what are your go-to tips for dealing with depression or feeling down or anything like that? We got a lot of really, really cool responses and I'm excited to share them with you when we get there. For now, let's open up, as we always do, by giving a brief overview of the parsha of this week's Torah portion. Um, and that is as follows. We have now moved on from Avram and Yitzchak. Uh, Avram being the first of our forefathers, Yitzchak the second. And now we are holding the story of Yaakov. Uh, at the end of last week's Torah portion, Yaakov uh, tricked his brother out of, the, out of the blessings, right? The firstborn blessings. And he runs away from the city of Be'er Sheva, which is where he lived, to the town of Haran, um, which is where his uncle lives. Um, and this week's Torah portion opens up with that verse. Vayetze Yaakov in Be'er Sheva. Yaakov leaves the city of Be'er Sheva and he goes to Haran. On the way, he stops off at a famous temple, uh, at a, I'm sorry, at a famous mountain called Temple Mount. Uh, well, at the time it was called Mount Moriah. Now it's called the Temple Mount. He lies down for the night, has a dream in, wherein he sees a ladder and angels climbing up the ladder, down the ladder, which has its symbolisms about the, the, the angels that are protecting him. There was a protect him inside the land, land of Israel, other ones to protect him outside the land of Israel. God is always with him. Yaakov arrives in Haran, he finds uh, the home that he's been looking for, which is his um, mother's brother, his uncle, Lavan, Lavan. And he begins to work for him for seven years for one wife, Turns out it's the wrong wife, right? First he marries Rachel, then he marries Leah. Another seven years he works for her, and then he, he works for him seven more years, this time for wages. Come again? Other way around. Well, he works seven years for Rachel, but marries Leah first. Oh, oh that's, that's, that's how it was going on in my head. That's why I said it that way. Uh, he actually marries them, I think, uh, is it a week apart or a year apart? It's, it's very, very brief. In other words, there's, there's, this, there's um, this misunderstanding that some people have, or I've encountered before from other people. Seven years? In other words, he didn't work seven years for Rachel, marry Leah, and then work another seven years and then marry Leah. He married her almost immediately. Oh. He married Rachel almost immediately after Leah. I didn't know that. And then worked seven years kind of as a, a back, back or <laughs> what do they call it? Like back payments. Anyways, he works another seven years for wages, and this is where Laban really starts to trick him. I mean, as if it's not enough that he tricked him into who he married. Um, he starts to trick him with his wages. First, Laban tells him, you'll have all of these speckled animals, and then you'll have these striped animals, and each time he keeps, whatever's born more seems to be the ones that are supposed to be for Laban, and no matter what, uh, he keeps changing the deal in order for it to be in that way. In any event, over the course of these years, Yaakov gives birth to 11 children. I'm sorry, 12 children. Uh, 11 boys and one girl. Um, uh, I don't have a chumash here exactly. They go through the whole thing perfectly, how it went back and forth. But in any event, in total, there are six boys to Leah, two boys to Leah's maidservant who also, uh, who, who Yaakov also has children with, um, and then to uh, Rachel's maidservant, so Bila and Zilpah. And then finally, one son, uh, I'm sorry, Leah has a girl, Dina, who we'll talk about later. And uh, then we have, um, finally, finally, Rachel gives birth to a son whose name is Yosef, and she asks that God should, should give her another son. Um, and then it's time for Yaakov to leave, and Yaakov leaves Lavan's house. There's a couple of details to go on there, but for now, let's just leave it as is. Um, Lavan doesn't notice that he's leaving, and then uh, he catches up with him, and he says, why are you just leaving in a, in, a, in a rush like this? Anyways, they have a little conversation, and then they make a peace treaty. They, they establish a m monument, um, which they call Gal Eid, which is, which is like a monument of a pile of stones. And Yaakov proceeds to the Holy Land where he is again met by his angels, right? The switching of the, uh, the changing of the guard. Okay. So that is this week's Torah portion. 
Um, and this week, I'd like to open the conversation by talking a little bit about um, differences of opinion that there are with regards to how we deal with crime. Um, generally, whenever there will be some sort of political conversation about whether it's prison reform, police reform, uh, cr crime, or criminal justice, or whatever it is, usually people split into two camps. The two camps go as follows. Number one, tough on crime. Oh, uh, we're seeing in a particular neighborhood there's more crime. Let's add more police. Let's make sure there's more policing. If there's more policing, there'll be more arrests. If there's more arrests, we'll get more of the bad actors off the street. We'll put, we'll put them in, into prison. The other side immediately says, hey, what's the purpose of this? All you're doing is filling up the prisons. Yeah, the, the, the police have their, have their hands full and you're getting nowhere. In fact, this whole, the whole word recidivism means that, that, that it's based off of a statistic in the US, which I believe is 40%, that 40% of criminals, even though they go through the prison system, they, they, they go through whatever they go through, they end up back on the streets and back doing the same things, the same crimes that they, that they did before they went into the prison system or whatever system it was. Um, so others argue, this whole tough on crime idea, not a good idea, right? Better speak softly. Like uh, my father used to tell me in Yiddish, whenever you try to, you know, you're trying to put something together very carefully and it involves getting the right piece into the right place, you're building a piece of furniture, whatever it is, he'd always say, not with strength, but with intellect, right? Don't, don't, don't just use your hands, use your mind to figure out exactly how you get the right piece in the right place. So some people say that's the right approach to crime, right? Uh, more, we need more social workers. We need, we need to figure out that in the right communities, there should be the right types of, uh, you know, uh, education and the right types of uh, role models. And, 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 you know, these people are growing up with, without uh, the right type of family. They're growing up and by the age of four, they've already joined a gang. So we got to tackle the problem at its root. You can't start at 25 years old. This guy's a criminal and now you're going to throw him into prison and you're going to change his way of life. No, you got to educate him. You got to figure out a way to transform him into a better person like that. Like that he actually, he, he won't do it anymore. Both of them, obviously have their virtues and their vices. Um, if there was a simple answer, I promise you every country around the world would be doing it. Um, and the purpose of our conversation today is not gonna be to give you what the right answer to this is. What I would like to do is add the Torah's voice to the conversation. In my view, the Torah is the ultimate truth. It's the word of Hashem. And we're gonna try to glean some lessons from this week's Torah portion with, with regards to exactly what it might, what the Torah has to add to this type of conversation. And to be honest, most importantly, if I may, I'd like to talk about the recidivism in our own lives. Hence my question on Facebook. Uh-oh. May I leave? Come again? May I leave now? <laughs> listen, if this class was going to be one of those, you know, just chill, chill, chillax and, and listen and, and don't be changed, <laughs> nobody would be here. You're all here because you want to hear what the Torah has to say to impact our lives. What I mean by recidivism in our own lives is that we all have the little criminals in our lives, right? The little things we know that we're bad at. Whatever it is, by the way, it could be physical. If it's your weight, if it's your bad habit, if it's your, I, I know most of the people here and I don't think anybody has a drinking issue, but these, right, these kind of things and bad habit, whether it's an anger management issue, lack of patience, whatever it is. And for whatever reason, very often we find ourselves dealing with the same issue over and over again. Comes Rosh Hashanah, comes New Year's, comes maybe even Thanksgiving. I don't know when it is. Everybody has their moments. When you say, I'm going to tackle this issue once and for all. And you work on it and, it, and you do. You, you do well for a little while, whatever it is, right? Whether it's depression, by the way. That was the question I gave on Facebook. But it could really be anything. And very often, even though we seem to have dealt with it, there seems to be recidivism where it comes back. So that's going to kind of be my main agenda during this class is to, to give you insight with regards to that and how we can deal with that in our lives. Okay? Sounds good? Yes. All right. So let's get started, as always, from this week's Torah portion. Um, Stephanie, you want to read the verse for us? The opening verse of this week's Torah portion. And after Jacob left Ber Berar, Shava, and he went to Haran. Okay. By Yetzir Yaakov Ber Shava, Yaakov leaves Ber Shava, and he goes to Haran. Now, the most common reason given for why Yaakov leaves Be'er Sheva is that he, that he has just stolen, quote-unquote, or tricked out of, uh, from Esau the blessings, right? And Esau wants to murder him, so he's running away, okay? But it turns out there's actually more than one reason, okay? Let me give you some background as to what this city is. This city that Yaakov is leaving is called Be'er Sheva. Um... 
The words Be'er Sheba can be translated in many ways. And believe it or not, we get more than one reason in the Torah as to why this city was called Be'er Sheba. And every time it seems to be related to a fellow whose name is Avimelech. Avimelech was the Philistine king at the time. And in the times of Avram, in the times of Yitzchak, he was the king. Um, this Avimelech uh, was, was at times uh, at odds with, with, with the Jewish people at the time. The Jewish people meaning the, uh, our forefathers, Avram and Yitzchak. And at times at truce with them. A ceasefire. Let's read a little bit about where this all started, okay? So in order to really fully get a picture, we got to back all the way up to, uh, the, to the times of Avram. Ar- uh, Arnold's cleaning his glasses. Baron, can you read for us? Text two. And Abraham contended with Amalek about the well of water that the servants of Amalek had forcibly seized. Amalek has said, I do not know who did this thing. Neither did you tell me, nor did I hear of it until today. Abraham took flocks and cattle and gave them to Amalek, and they both formed a covenant. Therefore, he named that place Beersheba, for they, for there they both swore, and they formed a covenant in Beersheba, Sheba and Amalek and Pishkol. His general arose, and they returned to the land of the Philistines. 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 Okay. Philistines. So. This is the beginning of contention between Avraham and his, uh, you know, uh, offspring, and this man whose name is Avimelech. It all starts, believe it or not, Avraham, like 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 many good Jews that I know today, was in real estate. <laughs> but whereas today, owning good a good piece of real estate means you own a skyscraper in Manhattan, or you own I don't know a, a fancy restaurant that's that's making a lot of money. Well, not don't, don't own a restaurant in COVID. It's not a good business I hear to go into right now. Yeah. <laughs> but. Um, but uh, Avram owned wells. This is what they did. Avram's men would dig wells. He would have water. With this water, he'd be able to, 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 to uh, uh, give his flock to drink, etc. Avimelech and his men very often had, had conflict with, with, with Avram over these wells. Eventually, they decide to... Make a ceasefire. We're not. Neither, neither of us is going to sabotage the others. I mean, not that Avram was doing most of the sabotaging. It was mainly Avimelech saying he's going to be at peace with Avram, um, and he says to him, "All right, let's make a treaty." They they put up a, a monument, and I'm oh, sorry, they don't put up a monument yet. They swear that neither of them is going to harm the other one, and because of this swearing, the Hebrew word for swearing is shivua. Therefore, they call this name of the city Be'er Sheva. Okay. Fast forward a generation, and a similar thing is happening with Yitzchak and the very same Philistines, believe it or not. Marilyn, can you read for us? Text three. This is a partial later. Go ahead. Uh, we need to unmute. And Isaac again dug the wells of water, which they had dug in the days of his father, Abraham, and the Philistines had stopped them up after Abraham's death. And he gave them names like the names that his father had given them. And Isaac's servants dug in the valley, and they found there a well of living waters. And the shepherds of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's shepherds, saying, the water is ours. So he named the well Essek, because they had contended with him. And he went up from there to Beersheba, And Abimelech went to him from Gerar, and a group of his companions, and Pichol, his general, and they said, we have seen that God was with you. So we said, let there now be an oath between us, between ourselves and you, and let us form a covenant covenant with you. And he named it Shiva. Therefore, the city is named Bear Sheva until this very day. Okay, hold on. So um, here again, a similar story. Yitzchak is digging wells. There's conflict with Avimelech. Again, his men try to stuff up uh, uh, Yitzchak's wells. By the way, he's even just reclaiming wells that belong to Avram. Either way, there's one after the other. Apparently, it was customary in those days to name your wells with names. So they gave them names. And one of them was even named Asek, which means contention. Okay, eventually... They, they, they too make a pact, they make an oath that they're not going to uh, 
uh, be at odds with each other. There's a ceasefire. And therefore, there's a few more wells afterwards. And Yaakov names, names one of them uh, Shiva, the seventh well. He names Shiva because it's the seventh well. And therefore, the city is called Be'er Sheva, the seventh well, until today. By the way, this city is still called Be'er Sheva until today. <laughs> and it also still has some conflict going on there. But we'll leave it that as it is. Yeah. Um, now, so comes Yaakov, right? And Yaakov's like, I don't want this business. I don't want any of this business. Fool me once. How does it go? Shame on, on, on you, right? Fool me twice. Shame on me. Right? Fool me, uh, I, forget, I forget exactly how it goes. Fool me three yeah. times. Whatever it is. And it's not just George W. Bush to get it wrong. It's oh, yeah. I was going to say that's better than Bush did. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's his famous. Whatever. Anyway, whatever it is. But fool me three times. I said, Yaakov says, I'm not doing that. Yaakov says, um, I am going to leave. I'm not having uh, any of this ceasefire business with Abimelech. I don't want this conflict. I don't want his ceasefires. Right? Uh, as, uh, as the Talmud says, Lomi Dufshech, Lomi Yoktzech. Right? That sometimes you tell a bee, I don't want your honey, I don't want your stink. Right? So he tells him, I'm off. And this is another one of the reasons why this, ver- this is another part of the backstory behind this week's opening verse of the parasha, Vayetze Yaakov Be'er Sheva, Vayetze Harana, that Yaakov leaves the city of Be'er Sheva, doesn't want any of his business, and he goes to Haram, to where Levin is. This is most evidenced by the Medrash, which tells us, uh, London, you want to read for us? You had unmuted yourself. Go for it. Rabbi Yudan said, the verse is to be read, and Yaakov fled from the wells of oaths. Namely, Yaakov said to himself, I don't want Abimelech, king of the Philistines, to approach me and say, swear to me as your father and grandfather did. So the Medrash looks at the name Be'er Sheva. It says, Vayetze Yaakov me Be'er Sheva. Yaakov left Be'er Sheva. It looks at the name Be'er Sheva as a loaded name. And says, Be'er Sheva is the well of oaths. It seems to be the city where you swear and the, swear, and the oath is broken. You swear and the oath is broken. So Yaakov wanted none of this. Therefore, Yaakov leaves. I don't need Abimelech. I, I'm, I'm not having anything to do with him. I'm going to leave to Haran to do my business in Haran. So now we start with the questions. Number one, what is the big deal? Seriously. I mean... With Avram and with Yitzchak, it seems to have ended well. I get it. There was some conflict. What, y- y- Yaakov can't take conflict? As if as if he ran to Haran and he ran away from conflict? He's trying to marry women and Lavan is giving him other women? And he's trying to he's trying to do business and Lavan keeps switching the deal on him to make more and more money off of him, robbing him blind, right? Yeah. That's not, the, the, Yaakov wasn't avoiding conflict. So what was the problem that Yaakov had with the way that his ancestors approached him? In other words, why was Yaakov afraid of a ceasefire, of making a ceasefire with Avimelech? Or of, of making a truce, calling a truce with Avimelech. More importantly, if it was good for the, there's another one here that I think also Bush messed up. If it was good for the goose, it was good for the gander. Is that how it goes? Yes. Right? Yeah. If it's good for Avram and Yitzchak, I promise you, I didn't prepare these in advance. <laughs> Just, <laughs> it's the wine getting to me. If, uh, if it was good for Avram and Yitzchak, in other words, each of them dealt with Avimelech. Yes, he wasn't the most agreeable fellow, but they managed to make a truce with him. Why is Yaakov so worried about that? In other words, what was Yaakov really trying to avoid? He was trying to, he's trying to avoid something here. The Medrash is pointing at something which Yaakov is leaving Be'er Sheva to avoid. What is it that he's avoiding? And as always, our final question is, and what is the lesson for us? Not the lesson for the cosmic world, the lesson for me and for Baron and for Stephanie and for Kalman and for everybody that's here. Right? Let's dive into it. So in order to understand what's going on over here, we have to understand that uh, while we opened our conversation today with a kind of uh, political question, you know, like how do you deal with criminals, etc., but really the same question could be asked of yourself. How do you, Yehuda, Julie, how do you deal with your own criminals, in other words, the, the personal criminals that you have within your own life? Right? The parts of you that you're not so uh, in favor of, right? I told you, you could use whichever one you want, whether it's depression, <laughs> bad habit, uh, uh, whatever, whatever it is, right? And I, I won't be so naive as to say that everybody here is perfect, right? We all have <laughs> our inner demons that we struggle with, whatever it is that we're struggling with. And the question is, how do we deal with it? So in general, there's two approaches, how to deal with it, just as there is with, crim- with, with criminals on the street that are outside of our own body, 
the criminals that we have within our, our within our own body. Also, there's two ways to deal with it, right? Let's take depression for instance. Okay, um, one day you're uh, I don't know you're 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 and uh, choose your own scenario. For some reason today you're in a bad mood, right? And you you feel the depression coming on. And uh, I don't know, maybe it's even you, you, you fought with someone in your family or you, wh- whatever it is, right, with your spouse, right, you're with, you're with a teenage child, those people are, uh, those are really hot, uh, uh, yeah. trigger, trigger happy, right? <laughs> so, and you're really in a bad mood. This is all happening. This is always, this has happened to all of us. You choose to say to yourself, listen, I'm not in a position right now to deal with this. I'm pushing this out of mind out of sight, out of mind, I'm pushing it away, I am going to a happy place. And you choose to do something which you know makes you happy. Call it a distraction, or call it whatever you want, but it leads to true happiness. Whether it's gardening for some, I know Marilyn, Julia, I know you guys are very into gardening, whether it's exercise or sports for others, or even if it's literally just a happy situation, right? I'll tell you, when I was in Crown Heights growing up, there was always a wedding. Every night there was a wedding. So when I was in yeshiva, if we, if, we, if we were really interested in having a good time, we'd just rock up to the wedding, you know, literally wedding crashers, and, uh, and dance a little bit. There was always good music, always good, always good food, good, good, uh, good drinks, right? You walk in, you have a drink, you dance with a couple of friends of yours. There's something that dancing does, and, and, and I know today, today there's things, there's Zumba, and there's laughter therapy, and there's all sorts of things like this, right? Where you put yourself in a happy position to get over it. Right now, let me ask you guys a question. Are you dealing with the issue? Certainly not. You're not dealing with the issue at hand. You're putting the issue aside and getting yourself into a happy mood, but does it work? Yes. We're at, and, and, and obviously we can never say 100% for certain because we've never done both things, but we can be pretty certain that if you would have stayed home, you would have probably ended up being moving into depression and the situation getting worse and worse and worse. And because you did X, Y, and Z, whatever it is, whether it's a physical activity, whether it's some sort of happy, you went, you went to a happy place, you want to go do something happy and put yourself in a happy mood, therefore you are happy. Another approach um, is to instead deal with it, right? It's the harder approach, almost always. But to say, oh, I feel, I feel depression coming on. Let me go to a, a place of calm and channel my emotions, understand what's going on, meditate, get a feeling for it, get a grapple over it, and overcome that depression, overcome that emotion, overcome that feeling. By the way, um, this is not limited to, to, to emotional or psychological issues in our lives. Right? We're, we're all familiar with this. This can be on a religious level too, right? Take an example of somebody who, who I don't know, they keep Shabbos generally, but they're struggling this. Recently, they've been struggling with keeping Shabbos with whatever X, Y, and Z it is not to do this on, Sh- on Shabbos. Right, or they usually keep kosher, but now their kosher has been taking a turn down because too many times they really want to go to a restaurant. The restaurant wasn't kosher, da, 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 whatever it is. Right, this person can choose the same thing, one of two paths. You go to a uh, 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 an inspirational retreat. You attend a wine and wisdom. You come out on a high. You're like, I'm inspired. I'm uh, uh, that's it. I'm gonna change. Right. I'm 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 gonna be doing amazing. And for some reason. It seems to come back afterwards, right? You, you're on a high for six months, and then boom, it goes down again. Now, don't get me wrong; I'm not bashing this 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 uh, this approach. It, it helps, and it's good, and it's in certain instances the best thing that we can do. But clearly, it's not the most effective because the fact is that when we choose to distract ourselves, or more more than distract ourselves, but to to move away from our inner demons or our inner criminals, to slap them in prison and say that's where you go, and out of sight, out of mind eventually they crop up. They're still there. You haven't really gotten rid of them. You haven't really eliminated them from, them from your life. You've just kind of, they're subdued beneath the surface. Now, just to show you how much I'm not bashing this approach, the entire Tanya that the Alter Rebbe writes, right, which I know many of you attended the Tanya classes with us, is based around this type of individual, the Benoni. The whole book is called The Book of Inbetweeners. Why? Because it's not co- talking about a righteous person. It's not talking about a wicked person. It's talking about somebody who's in the middle. In other words, he struggles and he overcomes the struggle. He struggles and he overcomes the struggle. Right? In the words of the Alter Rebbe in text 5, um, Kalman, you want to read for us? Reciting Shema or other parts of prayer is a spiritually opportune time for all. It is then 
that one can fixate their mind on the greatness of God and rouse their heart with fiery flames of love, motivating themselves to cleave to God by fulfilling his good and studying of and studying the Torah out of love. At that point, the evil vested in the left chamber of their heart is pressed by the goodness that has spread from the right chamber of the heart, which is influenced by the mind, which is in turn bound up with the greatness of God. So nobody's saying here that the Benoni every day prays with such fervor, right? But we all know, and hopefully every one of us has had such an experience, that prayer can be a very magical time with enough meditation and with enough, you know, proper uh, uh, focus on what you're saying and who you're praying to and how you're praying, etc. You get into your own zone, into your own moment, your own flow, and you're praying to God. And it could be a very inspirational and uplifting time. And sometimes the Bainuni, when he's at that level, feels like a tzaddik. He feels like a, like, a, like a holy man, like a righteous person. He's at the top of his game. Welcome, Phil. Here we go. Welcome, Phil. Good to have you with us. But inevitably, what happens? Because it's not a complete transformation, comes after prayer, and the Bainuni inevitably slides. Uh, Kalman, you want to keep it up? Text 6. After prayer, the evil impulses can e easily come back, mixing with goodness to challenge a person as they walk through the darkness of this world. Now, m mind you, let me, let me just clarify, even though we're saying that, that you eventually come back down into the darkness of this world, you come down into your plateau, it's not entirely useless, right? Has anybody here ever taken a sleeping pill? Yes. Yes? So then you know that when you wake up after sleeping, after taking the sleeping pill, there's kind of like a lingering effect of drowsiness. Right? Similarly, yeah. similarly says the Alter Rebbe, that if you have a good moment of prayer, a good day of prayer, it'll help in a real way for a few moments or whatever it is. Then eventually you have to get back to real life, like we say, right? You come crash landing. But you're still a little higher than you were. There's a lingering effect. Kalman, I'm sorry. Keep going. <laughs> the impact of the spiritual heights reached during prayer remain lingering in the mind, coupled with the innate love and fear of God latent in the heart. They can effectively overpower and control evil. Hmm. And so we're not bashing this, this approach at all. I, I just want to make that absolutely clear. We're not saying that there's two approaches and that one of them is better than the other, even though we're going to talk a lot about transformation starting now. Um, what we are saying is that this is a valid form of, of serving Hashem, and it helps so much, but the, it's important to recognize that whatever issue it is you're tackling, the issue is still there. All you've managed to do is suppress it, subdue it. What's the alternative? The alternative is transformation, right? Transformation means that instead of jumping into a wedding, jumping into your happy place and doing something that's going to uh, immediately make you make, make your mind go away from depression towards something else, right? An injection of endorphins and, and uh, uh, dopamine and uh, all the different, uh, uh, all the different uh, mins that we need in our head, right? Um, oxy, oxytocin, that's the other one, right? Which other one is? What's the happy, the happy, uh, the happy one? Um, Somebody help me. Julie. You should know this, I think. Serotonin. Serotonin, that's what I'm looking for. Thank you. <laughs> she, she had it on the tip of her tongue. She's just being respectful. She's like, all right, if the rabbi's going to try to figure it out on his own, let him do it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Anyways, so uh, so this is, and, and by the way, this is a very, very good idea. Nobody's bashing it and nobody's saying that it's not a good idea, right? But there's one approach where you do that, right? Where you, uh, dogs is another good one, right? I don't have any dogs. I know, Julie, I know you have dogs. Uh, Arnold, I know you have a dog. Right, and Baron, I know you have Grazi, right? For me, I have children, and that's already too much. I can't, have, right? But children is the same thing, by the way. You ever in a bad mood? Try playing with your dogs or playing with your children, not to compare them, right? But try, try playing with them for an hour. Whatever was bothering you before somehow seems gone, right? The silliness, the play, the, the, the rush of, of endorphins, all that, all that sort of thing seems to lift your spirits, right? Now, have you gotten written? Now, let's say you were depressed because, I don't know, because of the political climate or because of, uh, I don't know, something's going on in your family. Have you gotten rid of that issue? No. And if you think about it again, you'll probably become depressed again. Maybe it's a financial situation, right? Many people, that's what gets them depressed, right? Because of COVID, I don't, whatever it is, right? Lots of things get to us throughout the day. You haven't gotten rid of the issue by playing with a dog. You haven't gotten rid, gotten, gotten rid of the issue by uh, 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 having a good glass of wine, <laughs> right? All you've done is put it out of sight and out of mind, which is a good idea. But we're just only subduing it. 
The other, the other approach is you're starting to feel depressed. Stop what you're doing. Go take a walk. And let all those feelings of depression come in and analyze them one by one. What's causing me to become depressed? Breathe in and out. Look around. Counter those feelings. with the, oh, oh, I'm becoming depressed because of all the bad things in my life. What about all the good things in my life? Right? And start to actually deal with that depression and see how it's, it's, it's not entirely true. The parts of it that are true maybe can be used as catalysts for good. In other words, maybe you're depressed because you're gaining weight. So you say to yourself, I'm going to work on how to, how to lose weight. Right? Maybe you're depressed because of how you treat your spouse. So you say to yourself, I'm going to work. Whatever it is, you st- it, it's not, it, and it's not even so much about the actual acts and steps that you do as, as, as uh, subsequently. The main idea here is that you've chosen to lean in to the depression and figure out how to deal with that on a real level, right? And many people do this in different ways, whether it's through meditation, through, through taking a walk, through talking it out with someone, right? Many people do this with, th- with a therapist, and that's how they get past uh, depression or trauma or anything like that. Certainly, it takes a lot longer. Um, definitely, it takes a lot more willpower and discipline. But the idea here is much more transformative. Um, and this is the approach that the Baal Shem Tov sees in the words of the Mishnah. Um, in Pirkei Avot, in Ethics of Our Fathers, there's a Mishnah. It's part of a famous series of questions, right? Who is rich? Anybody knows? Who is rich? Arnold, who's rich? You don't remember? Come on. Anybody? The man who is happy with what he has. Very good. Who is rich? He was happy with what he has. Very good. Thank you. So who is strong? Anybody remember this one? It's a little bit harder. Elevation seats room. Julie, you want to read for us? Who is strong? Text eight. Who is mighty? Who is mighty? He who conquers his evil inclination, as it is said, he who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit is better than he who takes a city. Okay, now there are many different approaches to this. Julie, don't go anywhere. You're going to read for us the Baal Shanto's approach in just a second. So there's many different approaches. And conventional wisdom is, who is strong? Mm-hmm. Someone who has strong willpower. So he forces his Yetzir Hara, he forces his negative inclination, his evil inclination, says, don't you dare, not now. There's a great ad playing now on the circuit. And, and, and some, some, I don't know, I was watching something recently on YouTube or whatever it was, and an ad comes on for, for something against Crohn's. And, and they're treating Crohn's like it's a person or something. They keep talking to it. The patients keep, has anybody seen this one? Like, no. stop Crohn's, get away Crohn's, right? Something like that. Anybody seen this ad? No. Baron, you've seen it? He's nodding his head. I don't know if he's seen it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've I seen it a couple of times. You've seen it a couple of times, right? So maybe we're watching the same shows. I don't know what it is. <laughs> In any event. So this, this man, so the convention was that this is who is strong? Somebody who knows how to say stop. There's Yitzhara, right? There's evil inclination. All right, but Julie, tell us what does the Baal Shem Tov see in this verse? The Baal Shem Tov commented on the Mishnah. It doesn't say break his inclination; rather, it says conquer. To break the evil inclination is not a display of real strength. All it takes to break the evil inclination is common sense, which dictates that personal evil tendencies ought to be broken. The idea of conquering is to utilize one's energies and character traits, for there is much more grain with the power of the ox. Namely, the animal within is a powerful engine, even greater than the godly soul. Such a person uh, behaves with strength. This, then, is the Mishnah's dictum. Who is mighty? One who appropriates the force of his evil inclination and uses it for holiness. Thank you. Deep stuff. So if the U.S. goes to war with a communist country, which I know is a controversial uh, uh, move in and of itself, but we've done it before, right? Um, I don't know, Korea, uh, Russia, China, all the different, all, all the Vietnam. different, uh, come again? Vietnam. Vietnam, Vietnam exactly, right? Um, and we, and we win the war. We are now the ruling power in this country, right? Have we won the war? We haven't really won the war. We, we haven't really expanded democracy. All we've done is killed a whole bunch of people that were defending uh, socialism or, or, uh, or communism or whatever it is. We haven't really won the war. True winning of the war, and this has happened, maybe arguably in Japan after, after World War II, I don't know where the, where the right, is a war of the mind, right? And that can sometimes be done even without a single bullet being fired. If you can somehow spread the idea, and I, 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 um, I heard once, a, uh, I listened to a podcast once, wow, this is coming back in like a, a rush. I was running, it was right before I ran the marathon last year, 
and I was running, I was listening to this podcast, it was fascinating stuff. They were talking about the marketplace, the supermarket, the supermarket that we know of t- until today. The idea of the supermarket, they were saying that apparently the U.S. invested money in the supermarket because they wanted to hold the supermarket up. I, I guess the supermarket came it became popular at the same time as the Cold War. And the idea was to hold up a clear, shining example of democracy working. The, 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 the contrasting images of a supermarket where you can literally walk into the supermarket and get fresh deli, fresh bakery, you know, sushi, uh, whatever, and any single item in 30 different varieties on the shelf, right? And the same sh- in the same shop, you can buy a bed or you can buy a house or you can buy a trailer or you can buy a, a, a can of uh, tomato sauce, right? And that image, was the idea was to, to contrast that up versus the empty shelves that there often were in Russia or in the former Soviet Union, et cetera, right? The empty shelves that there were in, 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 in uh, corner stores where, where, where you couldn't have items, et cetera. And the, the, this, oh, this is all due to free market, et cetera. So my understanding is that the U.S. government, I don't remember, I wasn't planning to share this here, um, so I didn't really do, do proper research, but my understanding is that, the, that I just, just from a podcast that I heard once, my understanding is that the U.S. government actually actively pushed this agenda, like to try to show the supermarket as a, as a, 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 a symptom of the success of democracy. You remember the AMP? The AMP, what do you mean? The AMP supermarket in New York. I do not. I do. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. My father owned uh, small grocery stores. Okay. And um, the AMP came on after the war. Um, shortly after the war, and it was the AMP that actually uh, was the the, um, the first um, example of a modern day supermarket. Okay, I didn't know that. As a result, um, my father had to close. <laughs> close, close. I, I was going to say that before I start uh, promoting uh, supermarkets, I'm amazing about them. We're watching here in the U.S., yeah. especially now during COVID, how. Yeah. The- market might not have been the best idea, right? And now we moved it online and we made it even worse with things like Amazon or whatever. But leave yeah. it, that as it may, what is yeah. the idea of, of, of instead of taking a bomb and, and landing it in Moscow and killing thousands of people, instead pour some money into the supermarkets? What's the idea? The idea is, I want to show you that my idea is superior. I want to show you that my, my way of life, my, 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 my theory is superior, right? So ideally, if America wanted to take care of communism in a particular country, they would put people, educators on the ground to teach people how to show them and to illustrate and to demonstrate. And then the whole thing would fall apart. And some people point that this is what happened, that, that, that this is what happened in Japan, right? Because after World War II, Japan did become much more democratic. Be that as it may. Yeah. Either way, Baal Shem Tov says we can take that approach in our lives. What's going on here? Baal Shem Tov says maybe instead of Ezeh Gibar, who is mighty, he who overcomes his evil inclination, being somebody who literally has the willpower and the discipline to just not do it, maybe Ezeh Gibar, who is strong, it means somebody that has the ability to de- dig deep into the places that nobody wants to go. Nobody wants to lean into their depression. It's a scary place to go, right? Nobody wants to lean into their bad habit and actually understand what's going on here. Right? But if you talk to any therapist, they'll tell you that's the best thing to do. You got you to do it under the right conditions. And you shouldn't be doing it all day. <laughs> but but it, it, nobody wants to do it. Says the Bashat, who is strong? Somebody who goes in there and does it. Everybody with me here? Got it. We're good. Yep. Now, this approach... It's like, it's, 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 it's a gift. It's not something that's easy to do. And um, certainly you got to work with what you have. Um, and, 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 and it requires a life, lifetime worth of work. Um, but the Alter Rebbe has some tips for us. Okay. Uh, and this leads us to text 10. Phil, your microphone is working. Phil, are you? Oh, uh, yeah, you tell me, is it? We hear you loud and clear. Go for okay, it. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, I'm sorry. Let me expand this here. Some people are naturally drawn to academia. Such people channel all their emotion and passion into it, and they focus all of their intellectual power into it. Their very nature from birth drives a tremendous passion for knowledge. 
Then there are others who, as much as they may understand what they study, do not take particular pleasure in it to the extent that they should actually really think about it. Rather, they prefer to run after whatever is in their heart's desire all day. So the Alter Rebbe says, listen up, you're depressed. You have a certain tendency. You have a certain predisposition. Look, to those people that are naturally happy, they're pre, pre, uh, predisposed, is that the word? Yeah. To be happy people, good unto them. I'm not one of those people. So I got to work with what I have, right? Now, I might have a predisposition maybe to be melancholy. Says the Alter Rebbe, figure out how to channel that. Right? Figure out how to channel that. You're more of an academic person, channel that to there. Now, maybe I'm not a melancholy person. Maybe I'm more of an angry person. I, I lack patience and I have excitement, right? I get very excited about things. Channel that, channel that into studying Torah as well. Channel that into an idea, into a mitzvah, into something holy. The, uh, the Rebbe would often say, say this to people in letters, to people who, who struggled with this idea. Yehuda, can you read for us? You, you with us here? No, no reading. Arnold, text 11. You write that you um, that you are besieged with melancholy thoughts, though I find this somewhat surprising. If it is happening, well, you know what what is stated in Torah, or uh, Torah or uh, melancholy can also drive rig rigorous study, especially Torah study. How often do we struggle because we're too excited, we're too ADD, we're too our attention is not is not focused, and therefore we can't study. Right, so the rabbi is always saying you should study Torah every day. Study Torah, especially this rabbi here. <laughs> say, Come to a Torah class. Uh, study with me one on one. Whatever it is, right? Uh, pick up your Hebrew. Whatever it is, right? And you're like, I just don't have the ability to sit still and do that. I'm so busy and I'm so all over. I'm so all over the place. And when I come to the end of the day, my mind is everywhere. Right? This person who's depressed is already in that moment. There's something about being depressed and being melancholy that you're already very relaxed and very. And usually, it's a it's a negative thing. But this is a way that you can channel that feeling in the right direction. And imagine how you would feel if, 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 if in a situation where you were already down, you just use that down to, to study Torah, which will lift you up. Right? So ironically, you're going to use that emotion or that emotional state or that, predisp excuse me, that predisposition in order to channel it into something good and transform it in, into a catalyst for, for something good, for something positive. So now let's go back to Jacob. In section three, we are really going to, I mean, in the, the, in, the, in the last couple texts of our class, we're really going to drive this home with this idea of transformation. Now, don't get me wrong. Not every single thing in this world can be transformed. There are things in this world that are negative, that we should stick away from, and that cannot be transformed. But let's take this story of Abimelech and the Philistines, and let's imagine it as like a, you know, a broader cosmic struggle. You have Avram Avinu on one side, Abraham, our forefather, representing holiness, He's not just the, uh, the progenitor of, uh, of, uh, um, of monotheism, but he's, you know, the ultimate of holiness and devoting his life to God and everything. And the other, on the other hand, you have the Melech and the Philistines. Avram has a problem. No matter where he turns, Avi Melech seems to be in conflict with him. The forces of evil seem to be in, in, in conflict with the forces of positivity, right? Says Avraham, you know what I'm going to do? You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to push him away. I'm going to make a truce with him. You just don't bother me. I won't bother you. You stay where you are. You be who you are. And I will go about my holy life. In the words of the Rebbe, Stephanie, can you read for us? Text 12. Abraham and Isaac service was such that the force of evil were repelled so that they should not be obstruction, but they were not transformed to holiness. Thank you. So Avram and Yitzhak took the approach of, I get it, Avimelech is here, there's conflict to my Judaism, there's conflict to my holiness, there's conflict to my goodness. I am going to make a truce with them, you stay where you are, I won't deal with you, I won't have anything to do with you, and that's it. I move on. Similar to somebody who's struggling with inner demons and says, I put them aside, I put them in their little corner, I lock them up, and I move on with my life, my happy life, my go my merry way. But, in text 13 we learn that this was not the... Uh, the ultimate path of, of, of serving Hashem. In fact, Avram's service of Hashem in this way, Yitzchak's service of Hashem in this, in this way, was not long-lasting. In other words, they certainly get a lot of credit. Avram particularly started monotheism and Yitzchak taking it over, etc. 
But Avram and Yitzchak's path was not a way to transform the world. Kalman, you want to read for us? Text 13. Abraham successfully impacted the world, imparting the message that God is master of the universe. But the impact was only temporary, for his faith was only preserved among the members of Abraham's family, but not the world around them. And so Yaakov looks at his, at his forefathers and he says, this is not my path. This is not my way of serving Hashem. By the way, there are differences, differences between Avram and Yitzchak, the way they dealt with it. But the general idea was the same, that their approach to Avimelech was leave him where he is and I go, I go, I go on my merry way. I, I, I deal with what I deal with and I try to keep Avimelech in his little corner. Comes Yaakov and he says, I don't work this way. I don't work this way. Now, Av- I, uh, uh, Yaakov does not choose to transform Avimelech. Avimelech is not ready for transformation. For whatever reason, I don't know exactly what sort of cosmic uh, reasons there might have been why Avimelech was not, it was a type of negativity that at that point, and, and by the way, in this way, he's even following in his, in his forefather's footsteps. He recognizes, based on Avram and Yitzchak, that with Avimelech, you're going to have to deal in a way of suppression. But Yaakov says, I, 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 don't, I don't do suppression. I don't do that. Anything that comes my way, I transform it. What I do is, I take something and I transform it to goodness. In text 14, we see Yaakov's... I'm sorry, I always forget about the pictures. I'm supposed to be, supposed to be talking while this picture is up. In any event, um, in text 14, we get Yaakov's contrasted approach to, 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 uh, to, to, to dealing with, with negativity. Marilyn, can you read for us, please? That was the way Abraham and Isaac served God. By contrast, Jacob's way was to completely transform evil. As such, he couldn't make a peace agreement with Abimelech as he was, cur- was in his current evil state. Okay, so. so says, says Yaakov, he says, listen, I have a problem. The way that Abimelech is right now, I'm not getting anywhere. The most I'm going to be able to do is a truce. The most I'm going to be able to do is suppress him. I'll be able to suppress that evil and it won't affect me, it won't affect the world, it won't affect my life, but I, 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 will, not, I will not have transformed it to goodness. And that's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for something that I'm going to be able to transform. And without talking about how this, this would or wouldn't affect the conversation on the political level, let's talk about how it would affect our lives. There are certainly times in our lives when we need to suppress negativity. 100%. Uh, Hasidus talks about this in, 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 terms, of, in terms of two, two Aramaic words, iskafya and ishapcha. Iskafya means suppression, and ishapcha means transformation. And there are certainly times when the right approach is to suppress. Yes, if the depression, for, for instance, the al Rebbe always talks about depression, and he says depression, you have to deal with depression on your terms, not on depression's terms. So depression comes in the middle of your day while you're trying to accomplish something and do something positive. There is no way to transform that depression. Right now, you need to suppress it. Later on in the day, when on your terms, you're going to choose to be depressed. Choose to deal with issues, demons that you might have and transform them. That's the right way to deal with it. So there are definitely times we need to do this way and times we need to do that way. But it's important to understand that everything starts at home. That we have to, we, we, we have to, to we, we have to, 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 recognize that while suppression does sometimes work, it's not the end goal. And to quote King Solomon, for everything there's a time under the sun, right? There's a time for war and there's a time for peace. So there's a, similarly, there's a time for, for, for being at peace with your demons, so to speak, leaving them where they are and as long as they're not affecting what you're doing right now, you're doing good and you're happy and you're, and you're, 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 you're doing well. You're serving Hashem. But at, at, a, at a certain point, Sooner or later, or later still, at a certain point in our lives, we need to say to ourselves, hold on, hold up, hold up. It was good until now with the suppressing, but suppressing is not a permanent solution. At a certain point, I need to tackle this, this issue and I need to transform it. And a lot of you are looking and you're like, why? I don't get it. I only get a certain amount of years in this world. 70, 80, I know, I know, I know as Jews, we wish each other 120, 120 years of life. Right? But for the most part, these days, people are living to 80, to 90. I get it, people are living longer, 100, whatever. You're only given a certain amount of years in this life. So why can't I just look at myself and say, look, I have this issue, this thing that I'm traumatized by, this thing that I'm, uh, I don't know, you know, that I, that I uh, have to deal with, right? And I'm going to choose to just put it aside in its little corner. It's my own depression. It's my own issue. And I'm going to choose to just put it in its little corner, and I'm not going to deal with it. 
And really, Zoshi, what's wrong with just leaving it in this little corner until I until I die? Again, as and no, I, I get this is a major assumption to make, but let's assume that I can actually do this successfully until the end of my life. What's wrong? I'll tell you what's wrong. What's wrong is that that's not why we were put here in this world. What's wrong is that we as Jews have a mission of why we are in this world, and that mission is Mashiach. And what is Mashiach if not, I mean, what, what are the times of Mashiach if not the world transformed? To suppress and suppress and suppress and leave evil where it is, you've accomplished nothing. Nothing long term, at least. You, you've accomplished a lot in terms of you being able to keep going with your serving of Hashem. But you haven't transformed the world into a better place. If we can throughout our lives, even if it's just in one element, in one moment, in one place, one little space in our lives, one little iota of our character, if we can make a transformative move instead of a suppressive move, then we have prepared that little space of the world for Mashiach. Why? Because if I transform even just a little bit of myself, and Arnold transforms just a little bit of himself, and Stephanie, and Kalman, and Phil, and London, everybody that's here, if we can transform just a little bit of ourselves, by us each transforming ourselves, we are compoundedly, is that a word? In, uh, uh, we are collectively, let's use that word, we are collectively literally transforming the world, transforming the psyche of the world, transforming the world from a place that defies God into a place that, that not only embraces God, but supports and serves God. And uh, we'll end off with text 15. Again, I missed the... the... Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yaakov's approach was transformative. He wouldn't have been satisfied with a ceasefire. <laughs> Any event, in text 15, the Rebbe brings this home. Baron, you want to bring us home here? Go for it. Future redemption will come specifically through transformative Jacob, like, uh, like efforts. As we work throughout this exile to transform the negativity of the world around us, we become worthy of the third temple with the coming of the Mashiach. Our sages say that the temple will not be associated with Abraham, who, in a so who is associated with a mountain, nor Isaac, Isaac, who is associated with a field, rather with Jacob, who is associated with a house, a permanent structure. May we merit that time of world peace speedily. Thank you, Baron. So Avram had a beautiful way of serving Hashem. Yitzchak had a beautiful way of serving Hashem. But if we want to bring Mashiach, we have to be like Yaakov. In fact, the verse itself says so. In one of the prophecies about, about Mashiach, it says, not like Avram, not like Yitzchak, the third holy temple will be like Yaakov. Why? Because Yaakov's structure, Yaakov's way, Yaakov's path of life and mode of service, modus operandi of the way he served God, was that he transformed. And that is our job, to transform the world and make it a better place. And my friends, it does not start with criminal reform, I promise you. <laughs> criminal reform is an important thing, and it's an important debate, and we covered the full topic at length here, for those of you that were here at the JLI course that we gave two years back, on, uh, called Crime and Consequence. And there's a total approach to it, and that's great. But changing the world starts where? By electing a new president, right? Thank you, Arnold. That's, that's the answer I was looking for. Changing the world starts right here. Right? Changing the world starts right here. As the Rebbe told somebody in Yechidas, I believe it was Frank Lauterberg, who was a uh, senator to New Jersey. He finished, you know, a long audience with the Rebbe, like many, people, like many other people had. And he goes, to summarize, the Rebbe looks at him and says, you know, the summary will be, if tomorrow morning you will be different, then you, because this is the way politicians are. We're going to say something, we have a meeting, and then we'll summarize, and we'll put it in the minutes, and we'll have notes, and we'll have this, right? The Rebbe said, the summary will be, if tomorrow morning you will wake up, and you will be a better Jew than you were today, then that will be you transforming the world. You want to, again, I'll quote the Rebbe one more time. <laughs> I, I don't know why I have so many in my head on this. Gordon Zacks was a Jew who at the time was like, he was the head of, head of the UJA, he was the head of the United Jewish Appeal, and, and, and all the different the good things, the JNF, I think, and lots of good things. And he had fundraised millions of dollars at the time. And the Rebbe called him into Yechidus, and he had a private audience with the Rebbe, and the Rebbe told him these words. He said, you want to transform the world? You want to? He had just given a fiery speech by one of these big, you know, Jewish, I don't know, APAC or, 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 or the UJA appeal. Or I don't remember what it was. And they ever called him and said, you want to change the world? Start by changing yourself. You become closer to Hashem. You become a better Jew. You become a happier person. You become a better person. And then you will have transformed the entire world. I promise you. If we would each work on ourselves, Pasadena would be a much better place. As would Toronto uh, coming. 
<laughs> so l'chayim, l'chayim. Right. The transforming the world one person at a time, 11 people on a Zoom at a time, each of us in our own lives. L'chayim, l'chayim. All right. All right. All right. Thank you. Good night. You got it. Have a good night, Kalman. Thank you for joining us. Any questions?